here. Uh, again, welcome. And uh, please add your questions and say hi in the chat box. Uh, you can hover your mouse over the bottom of the Zoom screen and the option to select the chat box should pop up. Click on the chat box icon and say hi if you haven't already. Please use the small gray drop down menu above your chat box to address questions to all panelists and attendees if you'd like everyone to see your comment. Or select all panelists to, adjust, to just address the question to myself and Dave. So we may have some time for questions at the end as well and I'll be moder moderating the chat and doing my best to answer some as you go along. Now, I would like to introduce Dave. He is a certified California naturalist, a, a certification program created by UC Berkeley and UC Davis. Dave brings a breadth of experience and knowledge of birding and nature to his volunteer work, mentoring young birders, leading bird tours and nature hikes, and giving natural history talks. Dave is a Santa Rosa native and has done programs with Land Paths, Sonoma Land Trust, Sonoma County Agricultural Preservation, and Open Space District, the Wildlands Conservancy, and is a lead naturalist with West County Hawk Watch. Now, there is no charge for this event, which is made possible by the voters here in Sonoma County who fund the work of the Ag and Open Space District here in Sonoma County. So uh, we thank them today for this opportunity. Uh, as far as the Laguna Foundation is concerned, we are a nonprofit organization that works to restore, conserve, and inspire appreciation for the Laguna de Santa Rosa. The Laguna is a 22 mile long wetland complex with 254 square mile watershed that encompasses the businesses, infrastructure, and farmland, open space, and people living in the Sonoma County communities of Santa Rosa, Cotati, Bronner Park, and parts of Sebastopol and Windsor. The Laguna de Santa Rosa wetlands have been heavily impacted over time by development within its watershed and across the Santa Rosa Plain, and it now faces important issues that drive our restoration, conservation, and education work today. Despite the challenges, the Laguna is a biodiversity hotspot with a very special designation of being a wetland of international importance. There are only 34 sites in the United States with that designation. So with the help of the public, we conserve and restore these special wetlands, and we increase public knowledge and appreciation of the Laguna through our Learning Laguna, elementary school programs, Camp Tule Summer Camp, and community programs like this one tonight. We have our events listed up through early March for uh, our community education program. So we have a World Wetlands Day event. It's going to be a moonrise walk with yours truly. So I hope to see a few of you there. Uh, we have a stewardship event in the Uplands. We had one actually in on this Saturday, but Meadowlark Field is currently flooded, so that won't do. So look forward to next month. Uh, we have a artist, a local artist, Christopher Riger. He has his a talk about his Laguna Field Guide project, uh, which is currently hanging within Heron Hall. So please come and join us for that. Um, we have a fresh pressed flower workshop right, uh, what is it, the weekend right before Valentine's, so please join us. That is a lot of fun. Uh, you get to make bookmarks and all kinds of little uh, ornaments for uh, your, your beloved, so come join us and uh, have some fun. Uh, we have a Biology of Birds four-part series beginning with Bones and Skeletons with David Lucas in late February, so that'll go all the way through May. So uh, keep in touch for that as well. And we have the photographer, Jerry Dodrell. He is doing a landscape photography workshop. It's a two-day workshop. So um, that will be in early March. So before I let Dave get going here, I'd like to share a land acknowledgement. The Laguna sits within the homeland of the Coast Miwok and Southern Pomo people. To raise awareness for ancestral and current indigenous people's presence right here along the Laguna and throughout the Laguna watershed, we pay our respect to the past, present, and future generations of Coast Miwok and Southern Pomo people and their Wapo neighbors. So without further ado, I think I've talked enough, Dave. I will leave it to you and uh, enjoy. Thank All you. right. Well, welcome everybody for coming tonight, um, you know, on this nice rainy night. I can't hear you. Uh-oh. Um, hang on here. We'll try to get this worked out. It doesn't look like I'm muted. Hang on. All right, perfect. I think that's just me then. You're all set. <laughs> you hear me now? 
Hello, can you hear me? Okay, good. All right, well, we'll get rolling here. So, uh, introduction to waterfowl, the Pacific Flyway and the Pacific Coast. So if you're gonna have a waterfowl talk, you gotta understand what waterfowl are. And they, um, a lot of people have different ideas of what waterfowl are, but we're gonna actually let you know what exactly and what really are waterfowl. So we're all focused on the same topic. So waterfowl are the ducks, geese, and swans of the world. They have three characteristics which they share, webbed feet, a duck bill, and a complete wing molt. And it's probably the latter, the complete wing molt, that really separates them from uh, a great many of the birds of the world. So what is a complete wing molt? So during spring into summer, um, usually when the um, nest is hatched out and the ducks or geese or swans are hitting waterways with their young, um, the adult birds have a complete wing molt. So they wing molt almost all or all of their primary flight feathers, leaving them uh, flightless, which is why water is so important and why the wetland or the laguna would be so important to waterfowl is they need to be able to escape to water to escape most of their predators while they're flightless. During that time in the summer, the young birds are growing they grow in their feathers, they grow in their flight feathers, and at the same time, the adults molt in their new, brand new primary flight feathers, giving them the capability of flight again, which they're gonna need for when migration comes in the fall, because almost all waterfowl migrate. So in North America, they pretty much break down ducks into five categories, dabbling ducks, diving ducks, sea ducks, stiff-tailed ducks, and the whistling ducks. You could, you know, micromanage it, break it down into even more, or you can make it into bigger groups, but this is primarily what we break down to. So we'll start with the most successful and the uh, most easily recognized worldwide duck in the world, the mallard duck. So, that's a drake or male mallard duck. He's got the purple head, the chestnut breast, and then the bright yellow bill. But that's the same species of duck, a different individual, but see it has a green head. And one of the nicknames for mallard ducks is a green head because the drakes have the bright green head. But in that photograph, you can see he's got a purple head because lots of waterfowl, well, a lot of birds, especially the game birds and some of the waterfowl have an iridescence to their feathers. So depending on how the light is refracting through the feathers or reflecting off of the feathers, the color can change. You can see this one, the duck's head is purple when normally it's green. So that's a female mallard and she's much different colored. And we'll talk about why she's much different colored later. Um, these are really successful ducks. They've been introduced to places like New Zealand and Australia where they're actually an invasive species. And the reason why they're so successful both in North America and outside where they, their native range where they don't really belong is because they're just really adaptable and they're really a good generalist duck. They um, succeed in a lot of different varied habitats, a lot of different type of uh, wetland ecosystem types. So this is a gadwall, it's a drake, identified by that bright white speculum that you can see on its wing. So it's a medium sized um, dabbling duck. So the dabbling or puddle ducks are ducks that have the ability, and we're going through this first group of ducks are all dabbling ducks. Um, they have the ability of instant flight. So they could be laying in mud or laying in water and instantly just flap their wings like pretty much every bird or most of the birds you're probably familiar with and instantly take place and have flight. This uh, male gadwall here is feeding in some shallows. That's a gadwall pair. See the drake on the left and the hen or female on the right. 
They both have the white speculum on their wing. And you can see they're also both differently colored. So another really successful duck, the Northern Shoveler or Spoonie has a great big bill. And these ducks are really having a population increase. It's one of only four shoveler species worldwide. And it's the, also the most successful of all of the four shoveler species worldwide. And we're lucky because we get to have that successful duck right here in North America and right here in the Laguna wetlands. There's a female, you see that really oversized spoon bill. And once again, different colored, which we are gonna talk about. Another drake. And they're just a really good looking bird. I like them. Another drake in flight. See that oversized big black spoonbill. So they use that almost like a whale uses its baleen and they sift through the shallows and the muds and water in the shallows. Uh, a lot of times for macro invertebrates and zooplankton. There's a flock of them. Cinnamon teal. So this is the least abundant duck species in all of North America. It's a very understudied bird. Not many people have done much study on cinnamon teal. So we don't actually know a whole bunch about them unless we just extrapolate from the whole teal group by itself. It's endemic to the Western hemisphere. And it's, you know, you can see the males, the cinnamon colored birds really, really stand out, really quite attractive bird. There's a pair with a little bit of sun. You see that bright red eye reflecting. And we have three species of teal in North America. Cinnamon, green wing teal, and blue wing teal. And they're all small. These are small ducks. Very quick flyers, very maneuverable. And they're all really pretty in their own way. So if that wing happened to be out, stretched, you'd see a teal green or a teal blue speculum on the wing. And that's one thing that all the teal species share is that blue green speculum. Some more teal feeding in the shallows. These are dabbling ducks, so they're just kind of dabbling. Here's one of their cousins, the green winged teal. Once again, feeding in the shallows. So this is the smallest dabbling duck in North America and kind of shares the honor with a duck we'll talk about later as being the two smallest ducks of North America. You can see a good shot of the hen on the left. She has that green speculum on her wing. They hide it often, but when they fly, you see them. Another drake swimming through a pond. Couple feeding with a non-waterfowl. We got a photo bomb by a non-waterfowl, an American coot. They have webbed toes, but they do not have webbed feet. And here's the blue wing teal drake. And uh, they're one of my favorite. You can see a little bit of the blue spec speculum on his wing. And then you just see that half moon, that white half moon on his face on a blue head. Really pretty bird. Here we're getting into still puddle ducks, still 
dabbling ducks, but different kind here. These are American Wigeon, and they're the most goose-like of the ducks in North America. They have a very goose-like bill, and it makes a lot of sense because they're very goose-like in their eating, and they eat a lot of veg vegetable matter or vegetation. So there is one oddity in this picture. If you go up to the upper right, that's a hybrid duck, and that's probably half American Wigeon and half Eurasian Wigeon. So you can see it's really similar looking, except where the green is on the American Wigeon, it has a red or rust color of the Eurasian Wigeon. And we're seeing more and more Eurasian Wigeon um, on the west coast of California, Oregon, Washington than we probably ever have. So something's going on with this Eurasian species that's making a few of them migrate along the west coast for some reason. There's a close-up of the hybrid. And I, I call it a hybrid because it's not quite fully got the standout red that I'd like to see in a purebred. So I'm guessing it's probably got a little American widgeon in it. Another American widgeon. So this guy was kind of angry. I think someone got in on his area. You can see he's opening his up, up his mouth. So it's not a great picture, but it was the best one I could get. So the American widgeon in the water. Notice the head's really, really white and a really bright green. Get some iridescence on the green, but they mostly want to focus on the really white head. So this is called a storm widgeon. And there's, I don't know, I can't give a percentage, but very few, it's kind of a rarity um, where the head comes out really, really white in comparison to the average American widgeon. And hence they're called storm widgeon. And every once in a while you luck out and find one. This picture was taken at Schollenberger Park. And it's in a little mixed flock. There's American widgeon with it and also some Northern shovelers. And that is a flock of American widgeon out in a field feeding, just like you'd expect to see a flock of Canada geese. And hence they're very goose-like in their behavior and their feeding. They also whistle, they don't quack. So I'll kind of go through these pictures real quick because it's kind of a sequence and then I'll come back and talk. This is a northern pintail. This is a male. See that long pin feathers of the tail sticking out? And it's uh, a very long, it's a large duck and it's also very elongated. I like the water coming off the bill and the head. Oops, back space. But those photos were taken on a somewhat cloudy day, so not really good color to them. So Northern Pintail is the first duck to breed in spring when they return back to their nesting sites. And this is a troublesome duck in that, so if we went back a hundred years, we'd know that ducks in North America were failing and they were being market gunned. And part of the waterfall crash is what led to the forming of the National Wildlife Refuge System. It's also part of what helped form the National Audubon Society. Um, so now, if we go back to 2023, ducks are all on the rebound. Um, it's one of the huge conservation success stories, um, not just in North America, but worldwide. Um, it, some of the strategies used to bring these animals back are copied and used worldwide. Um, except still major failure with the northern pintail populations. Um, they're still declining and every strategy that's been used with other duck species fails with this duck. Um, lots of reasons why mostly because we have fragmented habitat so much. 
that it makes predation easier. So if you have smaller pieces and blocks of land, then it makes it easier for predators to find prey. We've got to remember that waterfowl are a prey species. They're fed upon by a lot of different predators. And if those nests can't be spread out over a wide area, then, and also the hen um, pintail is extremely picky in her nest choice. And coupled with fragmentation and loss of wetlands, um, they're still declining. And it's really a cause for concern. We see a lot on the West Coast. We see a lot of them in California. So if you're, um, you know, a birder and you go out a lot of times to Schollenberger or uh, out to the Baylands or anywhere along Highway 37, you're probably always seeing Northern Pintel. If you went to the Hamilton Flats or uh, anywhere along here, you'd see Northern Pintel and you probably think, well, geez, they must be doing really good because I see them all the time. But anywhere else in North America, you don't see them all the time. They're just not doing well. So video time. So I'm gonna show you two videos on different techniques for dabbling ducks to feed. This is a hen mallard. She's going through some water ferns, some azola. They primarily eat vegetation, but they'll take small aquatic animals. And we'll see her pull up one pretty soon. Probably got a little snail. Next one. These are Northern Shoveler. Okay, so let's go back to, we'll stay here. Um, so with that video, we got to see two different things. We got to see two different pair of northern shovelers, actually three, but two different pair of them were feeding. The back pair, the non-main characters, they were feeding in typical dabbler duck fashion, where they would tip their head down and they would reach down as long as their neck allows them, and you'd see their butt sticking up in the air. But these front two, this focus, they were doing a specialty feeding type that, as far as I know, only northern shovelers do. And they spin around really fast, making a vortex in the water and stirring up zooplankton and other little aquatic life forms, freshwater shrimp. And it brings them up to the surface where they could reach them. And then they skim with that almost whale-like baleen comb of a bill and filter out the food, let the water go. But you saw also one other thing, one other neat behavior. Um, when they were circling around feeding, the male stopped, he was interrupted because it's late uh, winter, early spring. And you can see also these, these three pair of shovelers, they were paired up already. And the other pair came through and all he focused on was the other male coming by his hen. So he started doing a head bob letting the other male know that this is my hen and uh, we're eating together and you could please uh, find another date. And then he went back to feeding when he felt the threat was gone. So we're gonna leave the dabbling ducks 
and we're going to go to the diving ducks. So one thing that separates diving ducks from dabbling ducks, diving ducks, they walk really uh, cumbersomely on land. They're kind of clumsy, actually, uh, compared to dabbling ducks, which are very good walkers. So the reason why is on a diving duck, the feet are way back at the back third of their body as compared to a dabbling duck where the feet are basically mid point of their body gives them really good balance. Um, so, but if you're a diver and you need to swim underwater a lot, then you want those feet set back farther. So you have a better propulsion system underwater. So they set the feet back farther, makes them clumsy on land, makes them walk awkwardly, but it also does another thing. It makes them not have the ability to direct flight. So as the dabbling ducks were, if you walked up to a dabbling duck, he would just be able to instantly fly and join the air and fly away just like, um, you know, any bird you see in your backyard. Diving ducks need to get a running start. So they use those feet set on the back third of their body, take a run, which we'll see in a little bit here, and then they get flight. And you see a lot of big birds um, like swans do that also. But for a you know, somewhat small bird. It's kind of different to see that. And this is a canvas back. They are endemic to North America and they're probably the most studied duck in all of North America, maybe worldwide, right up there with the mallard. Um, as far as how many studies have been done on them, they're a very fast flying duck, probably the fastest in North America. Then you can see thousands of these out on Highway 37, uh, Skaggs Island, the Baylands, all that area out there. Petaluma River. And um, there's a nice Drake canvas back in the front. And he's got an escort of three ready ducks with him. Also another diving duck, but a small one. And ready ducks are the smallest of the diving ducks. And they kind of share with that green winged teal being the smallest ducks in North America. And here are some greater scalp. And you can see he took off running. You can see all those splashes in the back, paddling with his feet, kind of running along the top of the water, getting his wings going. And now he's just lifted right there. So scalp, there's greater and lesser. We have both of them. And they're uh, primarily fly in segregated groups between sexes and ages. And they, um, they, like most waterfowl, especially ducks, migrate at nighttime in small flocks. They use natural um, features like river systems, mountain ranges, and the moonlight to navigate at nighttime when they migrate. Here's another diving duck. It's a pair of ringneck ducks. You can see that handsome drake, and then he's also got company of a pair of ready ducks with him. Ring neck ducks are endemic to North America as well. We have a lot of nice ducks here. So it's interesting, you'd think it would be called a ring billed duck with that bright white ring on its bill. But if this duck had stretched its neck out, right at the base of its neck where the black and the purple are meeting, you would see a nice kind of reddish brown rust cinnamon ring going all the way around its neck. Hence the name ring neck duck. That's a female. Still quite a different color than the male. Kind of a long range shot, but these are mergansers. This is a pair of hooded mergansers, and you can see the, even though it's kind of far away, you can see the longish serrated bills. There's three merganser species in North America, and they all predominantly eat fish. And this hooded merganser, they specialize in crayfish, whereas the red-breasted and common merganser, they specialize in actually catching fish fish. Here's his larger cousin, the common merganser. And this is a very large duck. And 
Once again, the male and the female are different colored. And this one was having quite the hair day. Another small diving duck, the bufflehead. And we see lots of these all around Sonoma County in the wintertime and basically none in the summertime. And these little divers, you can really see because they're so black and white, especially the males. And you can find these all over Bodega Bay, Spring Lake, Lake Ralphine. In the wintertime, they just come in in big numbers. So here we have the back three birds are buffleheads, two drakes, and then the second bird from the right is a female bufflehead, but the front bird is a ready duck. So divers oftentimes hang out together. Here's another diver, common golden eye. Really pretty, and you notice that gold eye just reflecting right back at you. This is a male, and they nest up in the boreal region. We see a lot of these also in wintertime all along the Russian River estuary, um, out in Hamilton Flats, the Baylands. And you probably see a couple of them at uh, Spring Lake or Lake Ralphine too. And also now, especially now with the, all the water, you'd find some of these in the Laguna de Santa Rosa. So here's sexual dimorphism. You guys can read it and then we'll talk about it. I'll actually read it. Same species, opposite sex and different physical appearance, or it's the phenotypic difference between males and females of the same species. So, I just want to show you that Canada goose. And then I want to go back to that. Let's see if I can get a good picture. Well, we'll stop there. So you see the male on the right and the female on the left. And it's true for all the dabbling ducks and it's true for all of the diving ducks in North America that they practice sexual dimorphism. And that's all about their breeding strategies. So diving ducks and dabbling ducks all pair off. And then that pair goes and chooses its little breeding nest range that's determined by the hen. And then she's going to brood the nest. So she's going to sit on top of those eggs and incubate them. So if they were brightly colored like the male ducks, then they'd be seen easily by predators because a lot of male ducks have either white or reflective cinnamon, blues, purples, greens that reflect light, and they would be seen by predators and that nest would not be successful. So in this case for sexual dimorphism in, in the waterfowl, it's all about their breeding strategy so that that hen can go undetected on the nest and brood and incubate those eggs. Conversely, here we are with our first goose, Canada goose. Geese do not practice sexual dimorphism because they have a completely different breeding strategy. Geese breed in numbers especially snow geese. So I'll just give a, a snow geese is like the perfect example of why. So if you went up to the tundra, went up to Alaska, and you'd find uh, a wetland with 10,000 snow geese. And if you're gonna have a nest in open land like that, you wanna blend in with your neighbor. You wanna look exactly like the goose right next to you and her nest. Because if you look any bit different, if something sticks out about you compared to the other 9,999 geese, 
then predators are going to key on that one bird. So you have to look just like your partner next to you. If you didn't, you would not have nest success. So you want to make sure that a jeer falcon or an arctic fox or a wolf doesn't find your nest. So Canada geese, here we go. Big geese, um, actually there's big geese, big Canada geese and smaller cackling geese, which looked exactly the same, except the size is quite a bit different. And that's all to do with where their breeding range was and where their migratory paths were. But we see a lot of that due to human um, development and agricultural practices kind of being washed out. So we're starting to see um, different geese take different migratory paths. Now we've noticed like if you lived in Sonoma County for as long as I have, you'll notice that when you were a kid, there were probably no Canada geese or very limited Canada geese only in wintertime. And now you see them at every park, every golf course, every ranch pond that you go to and they're non-migratory. These birds learned that they had all the food they needed right here. The weather's nice, it's a good climb. There's no sense to migrate out. So they just stay here now. And now we have year long resident Canada geese. Thankfully, their little cousins, the cackling geese are still practicing migration. And all the other, I mean, other Canada geese are still migratory as well. They're still wild Canada geese um, that migrate, but we also have residents that are not. These pictures were all taken at the Meadow Lane Ponds, where we're going to hopefully go Saturday. I'm not promising blue skies, though. Greater white-fronted geese or speckle bellies. And you can see those marble breasted chested birds, really pretty goose. Not sure about the whole greater white fronted name. I mean, it has a little bit of a white forehead and behind the bill, but anyways, somebody named it that and it stuck. They are really pretty geese though. And you can see thousands of these in the Sacramento Valley. One of their main stopovers and wintering grounds is in the Sacramento Valley. There's a couple different subspecies of them. And, but we do get some in Sonoma County as well every winter, usually coastal, but you never know where a flock of five to 10 will pull up. But if you want to see thousands of them, Sacramento Valley. Here's one of my favorite geese. This is a sea goose, the Pacific or Black Brant. And these guys are the marathon migrators of waterfowl in North America. They're known to migrate from the Alaskan staging areas to Baja, California, 3,000 miles in 60 to 72 hours nonstop, about 10 feet above the ocean water. They fly over the open ocean, they don't fly over land, and they fly nonstop. They lose 50 to 7, 30 to 50% of their body weight during migration. So they're very happy when they finally get to their destination of choice. Could be Baja, California. Could be Bodega Harbor in Bodega Bay. Could be Tamales Bay. Any of the bays up and down California coast all the way to Baja. And they're feeding on eelgrass. They're specific feeders. So if you don't have healthy eelgrass beds, you don't get healthy populations of black brant. And they'll, you know, one year Bodega Bay will have thousands of them in Bodega Harbor and other years they won't have very many because there wasn't a good eelgrass. I think they're really, really pretty goose. They're a smaller goose, not really big. A little bit of a close up. You can see it's a really pretty bird, but it also has this tough appearance to it for living in harsh conditions. 
small eyes, even the bills smaller. So this was interesting. If you notice those birds really good, each of these birds in the photo has a band on it, a color leg band and a metal bird band as well. And these were all out in Campbell Cove in Bodega Bay. And that is where they were from. They were near Nooksuit, North Slope Borough, Alaska. And if you ever see a band and get a picture, you can turn it into the USGS and you'll find out all about your bird. You can see who the bander was, where they were banded, who they were banding for. Tells you everything about the bird. Too young to fly when banded. So that lets you know that it was, you know, a hatchier bird, hadn't achieved flight yet. Just chilling on a sunny beach in Bodega Bay. So we'll jump back into ducks for a little bit. Perching ducks. Well, we have one perching duck in North America. And that would be the wood duck. So wood ducks are among North America's only species with a, both a migration population and a non-migratory population. So most of them migrate, especially out of the northern realm of their home, but a lot of them in the south don't migrate. Here's a pair of them. You can see the difference between the male and the female. Still practicing sexual dimorphism, even though these birds are, you know, um, cavity nesters, so they're making a nest inside of a tree. You probably all saw a Nat Geo video of the little baby wood ducks jumping out and bouncing off of the leaf litter on the forest floor and then scrambling to the nearest water when mom leads them. They whistle, they have a whole bunch of um, different whistling vocalizations. And one of their favorite foods are acorns. And you can pick up lots of iridescence on the wood duck. I mean, man, they're pretty darn beautiful. Okay, so here is a non, this is, how do I phrase it? Non-native bird to this portion of North America, black-bellied whistling duck. And this bird was seen, oh, probably for at least six months, either at Lake Ralphine or at uh, Roberts Lake in Rona Park. So it was a wild bird, it was, you know, free flight probably flying around with a few other ducks. Uh, I don't know how I got here. I don't think it was a cage bird. I don't think it was someone's um, poultry collection that got loose. It didn't have any wear on its feathers that would indicate, you know, it had been in any kind of a cage or pen or anything. It seemed like a pretty wild bird that just for whatever reason got lost. There's a population of them in the Southwest, kind of along the Colorado River. And then most of them are in, you know, Florida and the deep South like that, Louisiana. But this guy was in Sonoma County for a while. Never know what you're gonna see. And they're pretty uniquely shaped and built. Neat looking heads. So I like waterfowl, but so do a lot of other things. So here we got a male ready duck and a large sub-adult, not quite adult, bald eagle. And one of the byproducts of having a really successful conservation program and 
not just saving, but restoring and bringing back waterfowl is that we, I don't want to say inadvertently, but we brought back one of the main wintering food sources for bald eagles. So the second part of that conservation story was bringing back bald eagles. And now we have at least five breeding pair in Sonoma County, and we might be getting a brand new breeding pair right now as I talk to you. And one of their main winter food sources are waterfowl. And one of their favorites are diving ducks because it takes them longer to get flight. They have to run across the top of the water. So it makes it a little bit easier than getting a dabbling duck. Waterfowl, another reason why I like them is they're really beautiful, lots of different colors. I mean, they almost look um, soft or feminine, yet they're really hardy. I mean, they can fly 3,000 miles in 70 hours nonstop. They can float in water for hours and hours and then instantly take off in flight. And that's all because, you know, they're oil glands and constantly preening to keep the oil on the feathers so that they don't get waterlogged. So I want to thank some photographers. My photo credits to my wife, Christine Berry, to my good buddy, Tom Reynolds. And I also took some of those. You could contact me any way you choose or choose not to at all. Carlos, go ahead. Sure, yeah, so if anyone has any more questions, feel free to post them into the chat. Uh, otherwise, we have a couple here. Um, we can start with, <laughs> how many birds constitute a flock according to you, Dave? <laughs> to me, three. Three, okay. That's non-scientific, that's non-ornithological. Perfect. All right, and we had a question. Uh, as far as all the birds within your presentation, are all of these birds found in the Laguna? All of them can probably regularly, especially in wintertime, be found in the Laguna, except like the whistling duck you would not see. The, um, there was one other one that you would not see. Oh, the greater white-fronted geese you probably wouldn't see. Although actually like me and other birders have seen small flocks of them in wintertime, but you couldn't go out there and assume you'd find those. The rest of those birds, you could pretty much assume, especially now with you know flood stage and lots of water being around, pretty much if you can go to the right places at the right time, you could probably see all of those birds. And wood ducks are a big bird on the Laguna. They're not seen by a lot of people, but they're heard by people that look for them. Um, they love that oak woodland interface with the Laguna that has a big flood plain and floods out. And, um, you know, we've uh, changed that habitat a lot, you know, through our human presence and um, different practices that we do. But that should be a whole bunch of vernal pools with oak trees all through the, well, really all through the whole Santa Rosa plain. And it would just, that's just like your perfect uh, wood duck habitat. Uh, the Southern Pomo and the Miwok, they just must have walked around and seen, you know, thousands of wood ducks. I mean, cause it was just, there's no better habitat than what used to be the Santa Rosa Plain. Sorry, we got a great amount of questions coming in. So. Uh, can you say something about the strange crossbred mallards? If you know anything about that? Um, domestication. So, I mean, it's a simple answer and it's a complex answer. You could like talk for an hour on just that, but really it's a lot of domestication, um, poultry shows, poultry breeders that have bred the birds to be bigger for market. And then we've also bred them to, to, to go to bird shows. And so we've, the mallard was so well studied and so well known, and it's such a generalist duck and it's such an adaptable duck. It was easy to work with, um, easy to manipulate. So you can get all kinds of different crosses with it. You know, there's mallard Pekings, there's all kinds of untold domestic variety of 
show ducks, you know, call ducks um, that all have some form of mallard in them or not. And then there's different kind of mallards. There's blonde mallards. Um, yeah. Domestication. All right. <clears throat> and can you elaborate on one, what perching ducks are? So perching ducks. So the only perching duck that we really have in North America is the wood duck. And so he's different in that they're, or they're different in that they, the cavity nest, which very few ducks do. We have a couple of them in North America, hooded mergansers, they're cavity nesters, um, wood ducks, they're cavity nesters. So in other words, they're nesting in a wooden hole in a tree, usually built by a woodpecker. Um, and then they also have really, really suited claws on the tip of their web feet. And they're really good at climbing trees. They're really good at holding on to wet branches. And so they're very comfortable in a tree, which you don't see pretty much any of the other ducks actually hanging out in trees. All right. And how do these birds elaborate with, or sorry, <laughs> how do these birds deal with large storms? Good question. So, for our tour, like I've been hoping for like a month, oh, I hope, you know, we get a good rain and we have a lot of water to go out to the Laguna and check out the ducks. But when there's really big storms, so what do you want to call it? Uh, Pineapple Express, the cyclone, bomb cyclone, uh, atmospheric river. And when you get them backed up like we've had, like, you know, this is our eighth consecutive day of rain. So the birds, the water doesn't bother them and the rain doesn't really bother them. Actually, they kind of enjoy it, but the wind does. So they've all, they move around to more sheltered locations. They're not going to be out in the open where you'd see them easily pre-storm. So they've maybe moved inland a little bit to where it wasn't quite as windy. Or maybe they moved north or south just to get out of the flux of the winds. And then as soon as like the these, these storm window closes a little bit and we get back to a little bit more normal Sonoma County weather, those birds are just flock right back in because now with all this flooding and all these vernal pools being refilled and it's just opened up a whole new um, area, you know, widespread acreage of feeding opportunity for them. So they're going to be moving right back in. I mean, they're still here, but just not in the number they were pre bomb cyclone. And then, so they, a lot of them, Grizzly Island, they move into the Grizzly Island area where it's a big marsh mixed system where there's a lot more cover and they hang out in the cattails and tulies more. All right, thank you. And as far as bald eagles, someone's asking if you by chance know where Delta Pond might be and if you might know if there's a nesting pair out there. Um, so there's been a nesting pair along the Laguna de Santa Rosa probably one of the most let me see it's probably one of the oldest or one of the original breeding pair in Sonoma County I don't want to say it's our first breeding pair but it's right in there first second third um, and by now I'm sure that one of those adults has passed away or been replaced by another adult but um, Delta Pond is just right at the end of Willowside Road just walk west until you can't walk no more you come to a big chain link fence that's the city of Santa Rosa's Delta Pond. You can't go into it. It's all chained off. You can look into it with binoculars or a spotting scope. Um, but they don't breed there. That's just where they fly to. Um, they breed elsewhere in the Laguna de Santa Rosa. Uh, and, and that location has changed at least three times that I know of, because I do kind of track our Sonoma County bald eagles. Um, and right now they're breeding in a different location. Are Brant's pelagic ducks? No, I wouldn't really call them pelagic. They're sort of a maritime duck, but really, it's so they're sea based. But once they get to their breeding ground up in the Aleutian Islands and the uh, west coast of Alaska and up over the top and into, you know, going towards the pole. Um, 
you know, they're still land-based and they're living in shallow water bays where they can get that eelgrass. So they're not pelagic where like they're out in the open ocean, except for during migration, when they do that marathon 3000 mile flight in 70 hours, um, they have an averse reaction to flying over land and they want to fly over water, which is really difficult. And so, and there's been a lot of, um, not studies, but a lot of conjecture on what are the brant using to migrate? You know, if all the other ducks typically are using um, some sort of landmass, some sort of river system, some sort of mountain range. And if you've ever been to Alaska, you know, up in that northern region, you know, that's the Bering Straits, the Bering Sea, some of the roughest seas on planet Earth, some of the most adverse weather. Um, Yet here they are migrating, you know, 10, 20, 30 feet above the water level for 3,000 miles. It's pretty crazy. So they must be using the moon and stars somehow or have a, a feel to the Earth's magnetic pull. All right. And where can we find wood ducks here in Sonoma County? Wood ducks, really, I mean, they are all up and down almost the entirety of the Laguna de Santa Rosa. Okay, but so that sounds wow, really easy. But most of the Laguna de Santa Rosa is private and not accessible for most people. Um, or I'm trying to think if there's really there's almost no public Laguna de Santa Rosa um, access. And what is you would need to get to on a kayak, but you can get to different peripheral outside edges and look in with binoculars. Um, but a really good place, also the lower Russian River. I wouldn't go out there now to look for them, um, but they're out there all summer long, all fall, um, all along the lower Russian River from probably Duncan Mills, no, um, at least Guerneville all the way to the ocean. Um, and you can find them in uh, Cassini Ranch, the campground there. Another place I'm thinking is um, you'll find them along the Russian River if you go north into Hillsburg and Cloverdale, but they're a little tricky to find because you, and another place is Lake Sonoma. You can find them at Lake Sonoma. A lot of times, if you're going across the bridge into where they do the um, fish hatchery work, um, if you look in that lagoon section of Lake Sonoma, where the sturgeon used to be, you'll with binoculars you'll find wood ducks in there but you also got to remember that waterfowl are prey species so people eat them um ravens peregrine falcons cheer falcons cooper's hawks northern harriers bald eagles coyotes bobcats raccoons i mean there's a lot of things out there that want to eat a duck so they're pretty shy, like typically, like once they see you, they're either swimming away from you or flying away from you. And wood ducks tend to be one of the more shy of all the ducks too. Thank you. So do we get fulvous whistling ducks in California? We used to have more, but the black bellied have taken over everywhere. Mexican tree ducks, maybe? Um, no Mexican tree ducks. Um, fulvous... I'm trying to think if that's like, if they, that's a really big um, Louisiana, Texas, Corpus Christi, back into Florida, um, South West bird, not Southwest, Southeast bird. So I've never seen a vulvous whistling duck in California, but it doesn't mean that a rarity wouldn't show up or some uncommon, there might be some in really Southern California, but. Not that I've seen. And how accurate do you find the Merlin sound app? Um, don't use it, so I can't really speak to it. I do use it, and I enjoy it. And uh, while I may not be the greatest burger, I think it's a lot of fun to use, and it's a great way to get started. Good. Are canvasbacks the most studied simply because of their numbers? Um, no, they had a lot of intrinsic value. Um, they were really, 
wanted by hunters back, you know, a hundred years ago, they're a hardy big bird. Um, they came into the bays and it kind of made it somewhat easy and their, their numbers come up and down, but they also were doing kind of well so that it gave them a good opportunity to study them. And what about American and Eurasian Wigeon hybrids? Is that domestication or migration? No, that's migration. That's a migration event taking place. It's um, probably anthropomorphic in um, origin in that it's probably got something to do um, with human activity, and like I said, the big um, factors that have affected waterfowl migration anthropomorphically are um, agriculture and development. So development of large places, you know, cities and then agriculture. So like, um, trying to think of the cackling goose, uh, drawing a blank on the subspecies right now, the Aleutian cackling geese. So they were really endangered and their numbers really dwindled. And then we found out like up in Humboldt County, a lot of them, they were migrating straight to Humboldt County and eating in all the fields where the dairy farmers were raising their um, you know food plots because it was nice green, Humboldt County stayed green in the winter time, doesn't really freeze. And so there was a lot of food there. Um, so migrations got changed by, you know, that agricultural development of a big, pristine, you know, bay wetland ecosystem. All right. And a, the rarest waterfowl that you have observed here locally? Hmm. I don't know if I'd call ours rare. I don't, I don't know. I mean, I'd say probably the rarest Sonoma County waterfowl was that black-bellied whistling duck. Just because it kind of really doesn't belong here, but there it was. All right. And can you describe what a walk with you entails? And what gear would someone bring? Um, totally depends on what we're doing. Um, I would usually post those kind of details in like the walk synapsis so you'd know because um, I do different walks that are so they're they're all different like some walks are slow and short some are long and not so slow uh, some are detail oriented and some are generalist it just depends on what walk we're doing um, but if you're gonna just for general bird walk you would bring a binoculars um depending on the weather you'd wear layers um like if we we're gonna walk somewhere this weekend i'd probably wear rubber boots which i normally wouldn't do but this weekend i'd probably go to rubber boots with so much water being around um once again being this weekend i'd probably bring rain gear um a good field guide never hurts i'd bring a backpack i usually have a backpack um something to drink some snacks, stuff like that. But go back, I'll keep talking on that one. So it depends also where you're coming from and what you're looking for in, in a walk with, not just me, but with any guide that you're going out with. Um, you know, are you a photographer? Then you're gonna wanna bring photo equipment. Um, but not all walks are suited for photography. Like if you're really going far, you might not wanna carry it. 600 millimeter lens and a big you know tripod um so it kind of depends what like you're looking for in that walk also all right thank you and the last one will the field tour be canceled and is there more space and i can answer that uh, as far as being canceled we haven't come to any conclusions as far as that goes dave and i will be talking here yeah uh, throughout the week to see how that goes and we'll let everybody that has signed up for that know uh, is there more space? There is not, but you can sign up for the wait list and cross your fingers. Everyone is very excited for this. So um, yeah, just we'll keep you updated. Uh, you have anything to add, Dave? Yeah, I would say like, don't be discouraged because it's full. I would definitely sign my name up on the wait list because there's like a 10% attrition rate. Even if you were charging a deposit for a reservation, People don't show up. It's just the uh, nature of the game. 
So I would put my name on the wait list and hope for the best. Yeah, and you can find the wait list on Eventbrite. So if you try to purchase a ticket, it'll tell you you cannot, but you can add yourself to the wait list. And yeah, we'll leave it at that. Any other questions as far as that's concerned? Seems quiet. All right. Well, thank you, Dave. Thank you so much for uh, this wonderful presentation. Uh, if you guys have any more questions, please feel free to email us. And uh, I will send an email with these questions. I will send an email with a link to the recorded uh, webinar as well on YouTube. And other than that, I will be finishing off. And if you want to have the last word, Dave. Well, thank you all for coming to this wild world of waterfowl and for having an interest in wanting to learn about your wild Sonoma County. Um, I appreciate it. There's a lot of different things you could have done tonight and I appreciate spending time with you.